tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Hi, Otis here. Hope you're having a great day. I know I am. And I can thank Monday.com for that. They make my project collaboration life easy. Working remotely all the time can cause it fair and not so fair share of problems. And Monday.com helps solve those problems. No more countless emails, endless video meetings, lost documents, and a complete lack of transparency. Thanks to Monday.com and their teamwork platform that keeps teams of any size and industry on the same page. Monday.com keeps your team connected from wherever they are. It has an impact on the organization and managers know exactly what's going on with their employees. And it's easy to show the progress of your work to clients, stakeholders, or managers with easy, trackable accomplishments. And the best part, Monday.com has a free 14-day trial so you can test it out. So if you want your team to be more effective than ever, visit Monday.com for your free two-week trial. Build confidence within your team and reach every goal with ease. Visit monday.com to start your free two-week trial. When your teamwork is effective, nothing can stop you. To start your 14-day trial, go to monday.com and let them know that Otis sent you. Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in, turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. You're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome to Season 7, Episode 12. I'm your host, Otis Chirey. And in this episode, I'll be performing five spine-chilling tales for you, all of them from author Christopher Maxim, about sinister science, eerie instruments, odd advice, unusual occupations, and unforgettable fear. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first two terrifying tales. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now... It's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail. So lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. The show's about to begin. <laughs> Our first tale tonight from Christopher Maxim introduces us to a gentleman intrigued by the mysteries just beyond the boundaries of his parents' lab. Some things, as they say, may be better left undiscovered. Without further ado, I present to you my father's secret room. It had been racking my brain for months. What exactly did he keep in there? Why was he being so secretive? 
Even when I was younger, my father was more than happy to share his work with me at the dinner table. I listened intently, fascinated by the projects his biotech lab was working on. I didn't understand most of the jargon, but that's probably why he was so willing to reveal the hidden truths of the trade. He knew I wouldn't retain enough to be a liability. But then there's the room. It was an extension of his bedroom, one that was built when we moved in so he could do some of his work from home. Its secrets were locked behind a cast-iron door, and no matter how many times I asked, my father would not divulge what he described as being classified research. Eventually, I stopped nagging him about it. That brings us to the other day. My father woke me at 6.30 a.m. sharp for my weekly blood draw. It was something he started last year as a precaution. Knowing the dangers he potentially brought home each day, he felt the need to check in and make sure I wasn't infected with one of the many strains of harmful bacteria he worked on. Up to that point, I was in tip-top shape. No issues since the day he started. This day, however, broke the streak. My dad went to his secret room, ran his usual tests on my blood, and raced back to see me, startled by an alarming discovery. My blood had been tainted by something, as he described it. He assured me there was nothing to worry about. He would just need to go into work to run some more scans and get second opinions on the data. He promised to be back before dinner. With that, he rushed out the door, clearly rattled by his findings. When dinner time rolled around and he wasn't home, I became a bit worried and called him. He answered and said there were more tests to be performed, but everything was looking good. He told me to cook one of the microwave meals in the freezer and not to wait up, as he'd be late arriving home. I did, as he instructed, and got ready for bed. That's when an idea sprung to mind. I'd attempted to open my father's secret door on many occasions— to no avail. There were two deadbolts in place, as well as a run-of-the-mill padlock. Without the three separate keys needed to unlock it, it was a fruitless endeavor. Still, it was fun to try and imagine the wonders that would await me upon potentially opening it. It was the fuel that sparked many of my daydreams over the years. As I so often did when he wasn't home, I ventured into his bedroom and walked over to the mysterious door. Upon closer inspection, I was surprised to see the deadbolts undone. The only thing standing between me and my dad's classified research was the cheap lock hanging at the door's handle. He must have left in such haste that he didn't feel the need for redundancy. Sure, I wouldn't be prowling about his room while he was at the lab. Curiosity was a far stronger feeling than he knew. Knowing this would be my only chance I got to work, Using wire cutters and a thin metal coat hanger, I constructed a makeshift lockpick. Shaking it within the keyhole, however, was not rewarding. I only succeeded in twisting the pick into a pretzel-like form, rendering it useless. Disappointed, I knew what had to be done. It was time for Plan B. I felt somewhat foolish as I hurried out into the darkness of our garden in the backyard, I picked up a sizable stone and headed back in. My father's trust in me was broken, and he would soon know. My prize would have to be worth the damage, because there was no way I could hide or explain away a busted lock. But the allure of whatever it was that lurked within the room had such a strong pull that I almost didn't care. The need to see its contents far outweighed the fear of impending punishment. Once inside and back at the iron door, I looked down at the lock in my hand. I now had the power to solve the mystery, and I was elated. With a couple of vicious swings, the lock gave in to the force and fell to the floor below. My heart was racing as I slowly pulled the door open and peered inside, astonished. It was a truly marvelous sight. Inside my father's room was a plethora of tanks, wires, and devices, all of which looked to be lab-issued in design. 
Certainly not anything I had ever seen in a retail setting. Within the tanks, a blue neon liquid with pockets of air bubbling to the surface, each with its own unique creature. Some were fused together, others had too many eyes or appendages. One in particular that caught my attention was a fox-like rodent with transparent fur and skin, granting me a glimpse at its inner workings of its body. A close second favorite would have to have been a fiery orange bird the size of my palm with iridescent wings. All of these living marvels were suspended in animation, locked in a peaceful slumber behind their glass. The oddities in the room had far exceeded my expectations. My dad was creating new life, fathering a new era not only in his field, but in Mother Nature. These animals had the potential to deeply alter the face of Earth's wilderness. Perhaps they even had the power to benefit the world's ecosystem as a whole. I was so very proud of him. As I gazed at my father's work in awe, I noticed something. In the center of the room was another tank, larger than the rest, covered by a completely opaque black sheet. This must have been his pride and joy, a creature that stood out in a way that the others couldn't. A magic he must have captivated so brilliantly that he didn't even want to look at it himself for fear of being distracted, transfixed by its appearance. Excited, I was compelled to dislocate the sheet from the tank. In doing so, I was mortified. Behind the glass was a human, but only a portion of one. It was a head and partial torso, cut off just below the chest. New cells were being replicated at a steady pace, slowly completing its shape. With its increasingly rapid rate of regeneration, it looked as though it might be in a walking state by week's end. It being human didn't trouble me so much. It was the face. My face. This project of my dad's was a clone. A living, breathing copy of my DNA. Unsettled, I couldn't help but stare. Even the minutest detail was accurate, down to the individual hairs floating above its scalp. I was no longer enamored with my father's room. My stomach had turned to such a degree that I felt as though I had become sick. Then the strangest thing happened. My clone opened its eyes. On the other side of its nose were black ellipses, the likes of which I'd never seen on a face before. After its eyelids receded, the mouth opened and I was accosted by a muffled but frightening shriek. Its incomplete form thrashed about wildly. I ran away as fast as I could, the sound of glass shattering behind me. I foolishly forgot to close the door, too preoccupied with my own survival. I looked back once while running and saw the horrifying sight of a dark-eyed version of me from the chest up floating through the house to my position. I left as quickly as possible and sprinted into the trees toward my father's lab, coming from the direction of my home. A terrifying symphony of unnatural screams filled the forest. The facility where my father worked, as well as our home, was located along a dirt road in the woods. Moonlight soaked the path, granting me ample visibility to make my way there. My trek was met with the eerie soundscapes of the forest, including the occasional far-off outburst from my copy, who I knew must have been gaining on me. Having legs was an advantage. My pace never wavered, and I was able to reach the lab within the hour. Before venturing over to the entrance, I surveyed my surroundings. The unsavory sounds of midnight animals filled the air around me. The outcries of wolves, predatory birds, and bears. These, however, were not what I was listening for. Once certain that my copy hadn't followed me, I used the speaker box to communicate with the receptionist. Luckily, the response was immediate. Uh, how can we help you? Uh, hi, this is Garrett's son. I really need to see my dad. There was a brief pause before I received a reply. One moment. I waited patiently, but nervous. 
As I stood there, my ears were met with a familiar, inhuman sound, reverberating off the trees at the edge of the clearing. It was closing in. What are your full name, date of birth, and social security number? I was beginning to panic, but was able to provide the information requested. Thank you. One moment. The horrific sound was no longer distant. It grew louder as I watched the grotesque form of my clone floating up the path coming towards me. My breathing became sporadic as did my heart rate. You've been approved. You may enter at the sound of the buzzer. I quickly opened the door and entered the building, slamming it shut behind me. My other self did his best to charge at the closed door, but was unable to penetrate its thick metal layers. I was finally safe. At the front desk, the receptionist offered a greeting and pointed me in the direction of the next floor where my father's office was located. I thanked him and headed off upstairs. The second floor of the lab was a labyrinth. Red carpet and identical white doors weaving in and out of the dimly lit hallways. I tried turning the knob on the first door I saw, which belonged to room 371. It was locked. Hello? Is there anyone in there? I'm looking for my father. A man opened the door for me and sat down at his desk. The room wasn't anything special. Some workstations with a plant and waste bin in the corner. No sign of my father. I tried conversing with the man who let me in, but he ignored me completely. His strange demeanor and zombie-like state were unsettling. Unable to get any answers out of him, I left. The door was swiftly shut behind me. The other rooms were exactly the same. I tried dozens of them. There was always a single worker inside, all of whom ignored my presence. The closest I came to a conversation was one of them trembling, muttering to themselves. This isn't worth a paycheck. Right in time for Halloween... Our favorite time of the year here at Scary Stories Told in the Dark, Hulu is bringing out an original series, Hellstrom. Hellstrom is based on characters from Marvel Comics, though a darker, more chilling, and supernatural side of the Marvel comic universe, which sets it apart from the rest of the Marvel properties. Best described as mature, suspenseful, mysterious, scary, dark, Thrilling, chilling, authentic, dark, and dry humor. Starring an incredible ensemble cast with riveting performances, including Tom Austin, Sidney Lemon, Elizabeth Marvel, Robert Wisdom, Ariana Guerra, June Carroll, and Elaine Uhi. Hellstrom is essentially the story of a very complicated family. A woman who fell in love with a bad guy, discovered it much too late, and a horrible, traumatic family incident that tore everyone apart. It's the story of two broken children who were estranged and raised separately, becoming two very different people. But the world isn't ready for a Hellstrom family reunion. It's a thrilling ride, with a ton of twists and turns, as the series unravels the mysteries surrounding the Hellstrom family. Hellstrom is not the typical superhero comic book reimagination. It leans more to horror, with darker, more character-driven storylines. Nature versus nurture. How we overcome the demons we have, whether they're inherited or is a result of our life experience. You're invited to tune in now, as all episodes of Hulu's Hellstrom are streaming now only on Hulu. After that, I stopped knocking on doors altogether and simply wandered the hallways. It seemed there was a rule against speaking to outsiders. Just as I was about to go back down to the receptionist and ask for directions, I saw a door at the end of one of the halls, unlike the rest. It was white, but instead of a room number, there was a plaque affixed to its surface. Dr. Garrett Covenwood, head of operations. That was it, my dad's office. I waltzed over and knocked on the door. Dad, it's me. I made a mistake. I, I really need to talk to you. 
there was no response. Fortunately, the door was unlocked. I gently turned the knob and pushed it open, revealing the inner sanctum of my father's workplace. Another area I had always wanted to see, one that I constructed many times in my imagination. Unlike the secret room at home, his office was entirely normal. There was more red carpet and plain white walls. A single desk was perched in the corner, complete with a computer and piles of paperwork. On the opposite side was a filing cabinet and a few chairs. That was it. It was as ordinary and mundane as it could possibly be. But I was not disappointed. My only goal was to tell my dad about the copy and hope he would know what to do. I scoured the room in hopes of finding a phone to call him with. There wasn't one. Instead, I discovered a strange red button protruding from the side of his desk. In pressing it, something unexpected happened. I watched, amazed, as the far wall of my dad's office opened up and slid onto the corner, governed by an unseen mechanical interface. Behind it was a long, brightly lit tunnel. Upon crossing the threshold, I noticed several tanks lined up along the walls, similar to the ones back home. Inside them, more copies of me, suspended in bubbling liquid. I was, once again, mortified. I couldn't fathom what my dad was doing, or why. I racked my brain for answers, but none came. Before I could contemplate the matter any further, I noticed something. There was an opening at the end of the tunnel. Just before it was a final tank on the right wall, numbered 2263. The glass was broken, and its contents had been emptied. I raced over to the opening and found a room filled with computers and various electronic hardware. There, lying in the center of the room, was my father, his lower half in a pool of blood. I ran to his side and turned him over, tears wetting my face. He was still breathing, but barely. He managed to open his eyes and smiled upon seeing me. I thought I... I thought I told you not to wait up for me. I smiled but continued to cry. I'm sorry. I broke into your room and let out that thing. I didn't know what to do. He coughed. His eyes scanned his body and identified a gash at his lower abdomen. I applied pressure as best I could. It's okay. There are some things I need to tell you before I go. Please listen carefully. I wiped the tears away with my arm and nodded in agreement. What I heard changed my whole life. As you know, your mother died during childbirth. I was never the same after that. He coughed some more. I applied more pressure, hoping that it would keep him alive. What I never told you was that you died too. The birth was premature, and the complications that arose were too much for your fragile form. You never made it out of the operating room. I bore a look of shock and confusion, almost gasping as he spoke. I couldn't save your mother, but I thought I could save you, at least in some fashion. It was the only thing that kept me from losing my sanity after her death. I extracted the stem cells from your body and used them here to make more of you. Clones. Clones? I asked. But why? I couldn't bear the thought of being without the two of you. Saving you was my only hope. Unfortunately, there were side effects that came with the methods we used. He let out another loud cough. Blood dripped from his mouth. All of the clones gained unforeseen abilities. This affected their temperament and caused them to lash out. Each and every model went haywire within a day. You were our most successful attempt. You mean, I'm a clone? I could barely get the words out. Yes. But your vitals are the same as your predecessors. In addition to their vicious behavior, 
All of the previous versions of you became comatose within three months' time. That's when we placed them back in their tanks, where they remain in an eternal slumber. With the tests I ran today on the prototype at home, I thought I had solved it. I tried the antidote on one of the clones here at the lab. It backfired. Blood seeped out from behind my hands. No amount of pressure could stop it. I was able to wake it up, but it grew wilder than the rest. It had abilities the others didn't and used them to attack. How long have I been alive? How much time do I have left? He coughed some more. I wasn't sure he would even be able to respond. You have one more week. Y'all have neural implants. That's how I was able to give you your memories. I was saddened by the news, but it was strangely relieving to know the truth. My father looked up at me one last time. The blood was now pouring from his wound. I hope you can forgive me. I love you so... His eyes went blank, and his head fell in my arms. He was gone. I sat there for a long time and cried over my father's lifeless body. Even if I was only three months old and equipped with fabricated memories, he was the only family I ever knew. Even if it wasn't a real relationship, I loved him. As I wept, footsteps echoed in the distance. I turned to see the full-bodied clone that had broken free from the tunnel, standing at the edge of the room. His eyes were dark and his mouth opened at an unnatural angle. He let out a shriek that pierced my very soul and struck fear into my racing heart. I had to escape. But how? I stood to meet its horrific gaze, terrified and without many options. I tried conversing with it. Hello. Can you see me with those eyes of yours? I'm just like you. We're family, in a, in a sense. It tilted its head in curiosity. I cautiously walked towards it. It's okay. I'm not here to hurt you. I was created just as you were. We are the same, you and me. My heart was pounding hard as I closed the gap between us. See? There isn't anything to be afraid of. I'm your friend. Now, inches apart... I put my haphazard plan in motion. Without giving it a second thought, I pushed my clone aside with a great deal of force and rushed out of the tunnel and into my father's office. It screamed a sickening cry and ran to me. Eventually, I no longer heard its feet touching the floor. I turned to see it levitating in my direction, just like the unfinished prototype before it. I ran out of my dad's office and navigated the maze of halls with sheer luck, successfully making it down the stairs and to the first floor. I called out for the receptionist to help me, but he was not at his post. It seemed I was on my own. In a flash, I yanked open the front door and stumbled onto the cool night air. There on the path waiting for me was the prototype, still floating above the earth. I dashed to my right and took off into the trees, "'desperately hoping the shrubbery would hide me to some extent. "'It was no use. "'I looked back to see both clones honed in on my position, "'both flying into the forest. "'There was no way I could outrun them. "'Thinking quickly, I developed a theory. "'Their eyes were void of color. "'The thought of the exchange I had with the clone in my dad's office. "'It was a long shot.' but I carefully took cover behind a tree, walking as softly as I could manage. The clones followed suit, but dispersed at my last position, seemingly unaware of my whereabouts. They split up in an effort to find me. My theory was proven correct. They were blind. They were able to only react to sound. That's how they were able to navigate the forest in the dark. If it was quiet, I thought might be able to leave unnoticed. 
putting as little weight as possible into each of my steps, I made my way to another tree, then another. I repeated this process until I accidentally stepped onto a fallen branch, creating a loud crack that rang through the woods. My cover was blown. Within a matter of seconds, the two clones caught up to me and readied themselves for an attack. I was out of breath and energy, unable to run anymore. There would be no escaping them now. This was it, my final moments. Knowing I only had a week left anyway, I wasn't all that bothered. The only thing that kept me scared was the thought of what these foul creatures would unleash upon me. They had abilities unknown to the natural world. Seeing the agony my father went through when he passed, it was safe to assume I was in for a good deal of anguish at the hands of my other selves. I closed my eyes for the impending torment. That's when a fleeting thought bubbled to the surface. If I was a clone, just like them, did I have powers too? I opened my eyes and just barely had time to dodge a red stream of liquid that shot from the prototype's mouth. It met the tree at my side and incinerated its bark clean off. The other clone extended its arm and turned its hand in a circular motion. The space around us seemed to bend, making my vision blur. I was inflicted by hallucinations, the likes of which I never want to experience again. Bound by this power, the visions, at the time, felt all too real. I was standing in a white room in a hospital. From what I could tell, doctors were scrambling to deliver a baby. I managed to catch a glimpse of the woman between the outline of their forms. It was my mother. I had only ever seen her in pictures, but I was certain it was her. This was the day I was born, or at least when the actual me was born. Her pain cries ricocheted off the walls and burrowed into my ears. After a moment or two, the sound abruptly stopped and the doctors dispersed, forming a path to the table. I hesitantly stepped over to it and was greeted by a terrible sight. My mother was still. Her eyes glazed over. Something was moving within her abdomen. It began crawling its way out, blood and organs spilling over onto the floor. A face appeared above the mess. It was one of the clones, its dark eyes cutting through my stare and shaking me to my core. It expelled a black smoke from its mouth that swirled around the room and filled my field of view. It then dissipated, transitioning to another scene. I was now outside of my home, peering in through the window. My father and I were having dinner inside, laughing together, like we had on many nights before. A tear trickled down my cheek as I watched. Then, without warning, the version of me in the house turned to meet my gaze, its eyes consumed by a familiar darkness. It was the clone, still toying with me. A wicked smile danced across its face as it stood up from the table and stepped over to my father, who was still laughing as if nothing had happened. All the while, it never turned away, our eyes still locked in a sickening stare. I cried out futilely. The clone placed its hand on my father's head. I struck the glass to warn him, but it was of no use. His smile grew wider. I shut my eyes, not wishing to see what would come next. There was a loud crack, followed by the thud of a body meeting the floor. I reluctantly opened my eyes to see the clone right there at the window. I fell back in fear and hit my head on the unforgiving ground. The illusion was then broken. I found myself back in the forest, pinned to the ground by an unseen force. I had to act fast. I tried to tap into whatever reservoirs of energy I possessed. The clones readied themselves. I saw the prototype open its mouth again. I would be a goner if not for what happened next. Almost out of my control, I broke free of my restraints, releasing a wave of energy 
that propelled the copies deeper into the woods. I stood in an upright position and nervously awaited the return, still unsure of how to use my newfound abilities. Their screams bounced across the tree line. They appeared before me, their faces contorted in pure anger. With them, an armada of wildlife, deadly creatures that didn't exist in any textbook, a bear the size of a house with grass-like fur, wolves with six legs and three eyes, human-sized bipedal rabbits, and a slew of others I had no time to examine. They must have been failed experiments from the lab. They charged at me with bloodlust in their eyes, using what seemed like a collective of telekinetic energy. I was hurled upward into the air. They gathered below and waited for me to fall to them. I helplessly flailed about while descending to what I thought would be my inevitable death. On my descent, something awoke within me. All at once I stopped falling and hung there in the night sky facing the group below. Then almost instinctively, I unfolded my arms and legs out in front of me. Something I can only describe as a loud, metallic creak was expelled from my mouth while a glow left my skin and washed over the forest. I came to on the forest floor. The many lab experiments that once haunted me, including my clones, were scattered around inanimate on the ground. There were colorful sparks dancing across their heads. Their neural implants must have short-circuited in the blast. They wouldn't be chasing me again any time soon. As I strolled through the forest towards my home, I thought of my father. No matter how wrong he was in what he did, or how artificial my memories were, I still held him close to my heart. I would have to spend my last week of life mourning his death and finding a way to come to terms with everything. I don't know if I'm fit for an afterlife, so I can't be sure I'll ever see you again. Just know that I do forgive you and miss you terribly. You will always be my father. Do you experience stress, or have anxiety, or chronic pain, or have trouble sleeping at least once a week? You're not alone. Many of us do, including me. Personally, I lived years with chronic pain from a bad knee from playing football too long. Eventually, I had a knee joint replacement, and it's much better. But before that, I was searching for anything that would help with the pain. Then I discovered feels. Well, what's feels, you ask? It's a premium CBD delivered directly to your doorstep, which helps reduce stress, anxiety, pain, and sleeplessness. Become a member today by going to feels.com slash dark, and you'll get 50% off your first order with free shipping. Now, I can confirm it works wonders for pain and sleeplessness. In the first few months after my knee joint replacement, I was lucky to get more than two, maybe three hours of continuous sleep at a time, and not anymore, and my pain levels are under control as well. And it's easy to use, too. Place a few drops of feels under your tongue and feel the difference within minutes. The thing to remember about CBD is that finding your right dose is important, and everyone's dose is different, so leave room to experiment over the course of a week or so, and you may need to take more or less to get the effects you're after. And if you've never used CBD before, Feels offers a free CBD hotline to help guide your personal experience. The great thing is you can feel better naturally. Feels helps you feel better without any high, hangover, or addiction. And the best thing is you can join the Feels community to get Feels delivered to your door every month. You'll save money on every order and you can pause or cancel at any time. Feels has me feeling my best every day, and it can help you too. That's F-E-A-L-S dot com slash dark to become a member and get 50% automatically taken off your first order with free shipping. That's Feels dot com slash dark. And let them know that Otis sent you. Thanks so much for your support of this show and our sponsors who help make my program possible.
I hope you enjoyed my father's secret room, as written by Christopher Maxim and performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that first story and would like to see more of Mr. Maxim's work and help support him while you do, I'd like to encourage you to pick up a copy of one or more of his books available now on Amazon. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash maxim. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash maxim, spelled M-A-X-I-M. And you'll be redirected to our horror fiction website, creepypastastories.com, where you'll find links to Amazon, where you can pick up a copy of the author's latest collections, or connect with him on social media, or donate to them if you'd like to support what they do directly. On Amazon, for example, you'll find Chris's latest collection entitled How to Exit Your Body and Other Strange Tales. In this compilation of some of his very best work, you'll find stories about the secrets behind exiting your own body and get the answers to other timeless questions such as Could there be more than 24 hours in a day? Is it possible to use cheat codes on a Ouija board? And, of course, what is the meaning of life? You'll find the answers to these questions and more in the chilling collection guaranteed to horrify you in the best way possible. So pick up a copy today, open it up, turn the page, and take a journey to a world consumed with mystery in madness. Once again... Just visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash maxim and click the Amazon link to check out Chris's books today. And if you pick up a copy, be sure to leave a five-star review and a kind word and let him know you heard about his work on this show. Thanks again for your support of this program and of tonight's featured author. It means a lot to both of us. Up next, we've got a second tale of terror for you, courtesy once again of Christopher Maxim. In it, a musician gets the deal of a lifetime on a used piano. It's destined to become one of his most prized possessions, or will he discover the hard way that you get what you pay for? Without further ado, I present to you The Haunted Piano. I'm a musician, not a terribly great one, but still, I consider myself a musician. I can play with the best of them, and I know my way around an instrument or two. More importantly, I'm a collector. I collect uh, various items, ranging from the odd to the obscure. There's no rhyme or reason to my collection. It consists of anything uniquely interesting I can get my hands on. That's why, when I saw an ad on Craigslist for a vintage, rustic red piano, I couldn't help but reach out to the seller. The ad's title seemed normal enough. Old piano, free to a good home. I'd seen countless like it before. Nothing out of the ordinary, and certainly not something that would normally grab my attention. Still, I felt a strange need to click on it. Perhaps I was bored. Or maybe I just wanted to see what it looked like. Either way, I gave in to my compulsion. Upon clicking the ad, there was no picture. Just an anomalous but intriguing story. It read something like this. I'm offering my piano to anyone who's willing to come and pick it up. It's very old, but still playable. I can prove this upon your arrival. It's red and bears no brand markings. This is because it was made by my great-grandfather. It's a -a one-of-a-kind. He went out himself and chopped down a redwood tree to provide the material to build it. It took him many days to finally cut down the tree and much, much longer to finish making the piano. Nearly his entire life was put into this thing. I, however, have no use for it. It's been passed down in my family many times over. I have no wish to continue the tradition and the piano is currently taking up too much space in my home. I want it as gone as quickly as possible. You can reach me by phone at the number listed below. 
Serious inquiries only. Margaret. Reading the ad sparked my curiosity. One of a kind. Redwood tree? How strange and absurd. I had to see this thing. If it was half as remarkable as Margaret's description made it out to be, then it was a must-have for my ever-growing collection. As such, I decided to give her a call. Margaret answered the phone after the first ring and immediately asked, Is this about the piano? She was thrilled to hear I was interested. I, too, was thrilled, happy to know it was still available. We set up a time the next day for me to come over and take a look at it. I hung up the phone excited as could be. I had a feeling this piano would become the new centerpiece of my collection. My antiques and oddities spanned many years of history, as well as numerous countries. They ranged anywhere from the mundane to the wildly bizarre, but all of them were nothing if not great conversation pieces. Some of my favorites included a genuine voodoo doll from Louisiana, a tooth from a saber-toothed cat, a book of spells written by an alleged witch, and a piece of an antler from the world's largest moose. Being a musician, I also owned countless instruments, too many to list. Each time I acquired a new item, my heart would race with excitement, whatever it was becoming the focus of my attention. The piano was no different. I couldn't wait to see it in person. I woke up the following day with no resistance to my alarm, swiftly starting my daily routine in an effort to minimize the time between me and Margaret. She said she was an early bird and that I could swing by early. With this in mind, I showered, brushed my teeth, and got dressed at a record pace, making it out the door roughly 25 minutes after getting out of bed. It might sound silly to be so worked up over a material object, but to that I'd say you must not be a collector. Seeing this piano in person was my mission, and it was one I intended to see through to the end. I found myself at Margaret's home within the hour. It was a quaint cottage at the end of a dead-end road, surrounded by shrubbery and forest. There was an old tire swing in the backyard, indicating that it may have been where Margaret grew up. I wondered if her parents had passed away and left her the house. Maybe the piano reminded her of them, and that was the real reason she was getting rid of it. My speculation was interrupted by a woman racing out of the cottage to greet me. She signaled for me to come inside and went back in herself. This was no doubt Margaret. I hadn't identified myself in any way, but it wasn't likely that she received many visitors out where she was. Eager to see the piano, I quickly jumped out of my car and made my way up the stone walkway to the front door. Entering the house, Margaret seemed overjoyed to see me. It was jarring, but certainly made things a little less awkward. We exchanged a few pleasantries before she rushed me over to the room that housed the piano. She was excited to show me it, just as excited as I was to see it. I matched her pace as we made our way there. Upon entering, I stopped dead in my tracks. There, just a few yards away, was the piano in all of its glory. It was a beautiful concoction of wood and ivory, the likes of which I'd never seen. It had such a striking red color, giving it an illustrious and bold finish, and the design was magnificent. Simple, yet elegant, highly original, and certainly one of a kind, like Margaret stated in her ad. I stood there for a moment, my mouth agape in awe. Margaret mistook my reaction for disinterest, quickly going off on a sales pitch about his charm and history. Then she sat down at its stool and placed her hands over the keys. I tuned it yesterday after your call. Let's hear how it sounds. Margaret played a beautiful piece. In addition to playing, she sang. This is when I took my attention away from the piano and allowed myself to notice her. She was young, maybe in her late twenties, beautiful, slender. She had silver highlights in her hair, giving it a strange, albeit lovely, luster. 
Her singing voice, accompanied by the wonderfully rich tone of the piano, captivated me in a way that I can't put into words. I allowed myself to be taken by the song until she finished. Before I could compliment her, Margaret continued her well-rehearsed sales pitch. I don't know if it was her playing or her voice, but I was sold the minute she touched the keys. Because of this, I interrupted her. I'll take it. She was astounded when I said this. Really? You will? Oh, wonderful. We were both happy, and everything seemed fine, but one fact kept creeping and crawling in the back of my mind. The history of each piece in my collection was very important to me, and the piano had gaps that needed to be filled. So you've lived in this house your whole life? I asked, secretly fishing for information. Yes, as did my parents. This house is very old, older than the piano. And your great-grandfather, he lived here as well? I asked. Yes, he did. Well, Redwood's only grown California, and they're truly massive. It seems unlikely that he would have made the trek out there, or even have been able to chop one down, especially with the many trees here at his disposal. It was at this point that Margaret realized I had caught her in a lie. She apologized to me and came clean. It would seem that the piano was made from a red tree, just not a redwood. Instead, it was a strange tree located deep in a nearby forest. Being an avid historian, Margaret's great-grandfather knew all about it. This particular tree was a local legend, and it had always been his dream to find it. It was known as the Blood Tree, a sacred place of Native American worship from a time long since past. Anyone who touched it was said to live a long life filled with luck and prosperity. Those who wounded it, however, would forever know fear and misfortune. Her great-grandfather, of course, fell into the latter category. Though she claimed to not believe in the legend, she was worried the curse would scare off anyone who wanted it. Dark past or not, I still wanted it even more than I had previously. Despite Margaret's deception, I attempted to offer her money. She wouldn't have it, insisting I'd just take the thing off her hands. That would have been fine, but I couldn't bring myself to offer nothing in return. Eventually, I broke her down, offering over an envelope with a few hundred bucks in it. She reluctantly accepted it and helped me lift the thing onto the bed of my truck. I waved and drove off, satisfied with my purchase. Later on, with the help of a friend, I positioned it in the perfect spot in my living room. I had a new piece for the collection, and all was right in the world. Or so I thought. For a few days, my life continued as it normally did. My routine remained unchanged. The only difference was the new piece of furniture that grabbed my attention whenever I entered the room. After a while, I barely noticed it was there. Despite its beauty, it soon blended in with the rest of my home, much like the other items in my collection. One night, however, changed this. I had just lain down and begun drifting into a light sleep when a loud bang downstairs jolted me awake. I jumped out of bed and took a moment to gather my wits. The sound was unmistakably the piano's fallboard slamming shut over the keys. That could easily happen on its own had I left it open. This was not the case. I hadn't played the piano once since I procured it. So what created the sound? I raced downstairs in an effort to satisfy my curiosity and put my mind at ease. What I found didn't either. The piano's fallboard was up. Not only had it not shut over the keys... It was inexplicably open, despite my never touching it. Confusion swam through my brain, but soon submitted to the clutches of late-night weariness. In an effort to make sense of things, I shut the fallboard and chalked up the noise to an animal outside before venturing back to bed. Nothing to worry about. The next day was pretty normal, at first. 
I woke up early, took a shower, brushed my teeth, and started my commute. I worked and dealt with the stress that came along with it, just as I always did. The piano was the furthest thing from my mind. It wasn't until I got home that it crept its way back in. Upon opening the door to my house, I was greeted by a cold gust that rushed out from within. I hadn't left the A.C. on, so this was strange. I walked into the living room and set my jacket on the couch, and then looked up and noticed the piano. The fallboard. It was up. That couldn't be. I shut it the night before. Had someone broken in? I sped around my house, a kitchen knife in hand, ready to attack any would-be intruder. There was no one. After checking every inch of the house, I eventually found myself back in the living room in front of the piano. The fallboard was now down. Was I going mad? No, of course not. This was just the byproduct of an exhausted, overworked mind. Nothing more. At least that's what I told myself to keep from dwelling on it. Still somewhat frazzled, I escaped to my bedroom and attempted to catch some shut-eye. After changing out of my work attire and into my nightwear, my body fell into bed, an ocean of warm blankets and pillows enveloping me. A good end to a bad day, I thought. As luck would have it, sleep would elude my grasp. Quickly, after closing my eyes, there was another sound downstairs. This time, it wasn't the fallboard. No, it was music. Not just any music, either. It was the piano. With nothing but adrenaline to guide me, I ran downstairs to see what was going on. Upon reaching the bottom step, the music stopped, and I watched as the fallboard slammed itself shut over the keys. My heart sank as I stood in place, shocked. When the moment passed, I ran back to my room and locked the door behind me. A vile mixture of fear and dismay crept under the covers with me. Company, often kept when hiding from creatures in the dark, the byproducts of an overactive imagination. This monster, however, was all too real. The sound of my alarm woke me the next day. I was surprised I slept, wondering if the previous night was a bad dream. This wasn't the case, but my mind gave in to the notion. Living in a state of denial was better than living in a world where pianos came to life. It was a splendid defense mechanism, and one that allowed me to go about my day without fear or unease. I left, went to work, came home, and went to bed. Everything was back to normal, just as I told myself it was. But lies only stretched so far. The familiar pang of ivory key snuck into my room as panic set in again. That's when it hit me. This wasn't paranormal. It couldn't be. It was a cheap parlor trick. Margaret must have outfitted the piano to play itself, much like the player pianos of old. This was just a prank, a laugh at my expense. That's why the dang thing was free. Today's episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark is proudly brought to you by Monday.com. Hi, Otis here. Hope you're having a great day. I know I am. And I can thank Monday.com for that. They make my project collaboration life easy. No more countless emails, endless video meetings, lost documents, and a complete lack of transparency. Thanks to Monday.com and their teamwork platform that keeps teams of any size and industry on the same page. And the best part, Monday.com has a free 14-day trial so you can test it out. What I like about Monday.com is no wasting time on sync meetings, emails, or looking for an updated version. Monday.com keeps your team connected from wherever they are. And Monday.com is easy to use. It's flexible, improves coordination between your teams and departments, and you can customize it to fit a specific workflow. Monday.com 
creates team confidence, knowing that everyone is focused on their work that matters most. It has an impact on the organization, and managers know exactly what's going on with their employees. And it's easy to show the progress of your work to clients, stakeholders, or managers with easy, trackable accomplishments. There are ready-to-go templates for any use case with built-in solutions for your industry-specific workflow. Marketing, sales, CRM, construction, HR, real estate, IT, media production, and so much more. Monday.com brings teams together so you can plan, manage, and track everything your team is working on in one centralized place. So if you want your team to be more effective than ever, visit monday.com for your free two-week trial. When your teamwork is effective, nothing can stop you. To start your 14-day trial, go to monday.com. That's M-O-N-D-A-Y dot com. And let them know that Otis sent you. Thanks so much for your support of this show and our sponsors who help make my program possible. I ran downstairs to solve the mystery once and for all. Like clockwork, as soon as my foot touched the bottom step, the piano stopped playing. I walked over to it nonchalantly, confident in my new theory. Upon opening it up and exploring all of its crevices, I was surprised by what I saw. It was just a normal piano. Nothing extra was added in its creation to make it play on its own. Nothing at all. My calm demeanor vanished. I stared at the redwood and ivory keys before me and almost felt compelled to ask, What are you? Instead, I remained silent. This silence, however, was quickly obliterated by the sound of music as the piano began playing itself once again. I wanted to run, but terror kept me still. I watched the horror unfold. The keys were pressed down hard, controlled by an unseen force. A haunting piece filled the room as pictures fell from the walls. The house began to shake around me. My eyes darted back and forth in fear, but then noticed something outside. Standing at my window was a shadowy figure. It took off before the moonlight could reveal its identity. This was enough to break my trance. I ran outside to escape the madness. All the while, the song raged on. The house continued to shake behind me. The dark figure was nowhere to be seen. Margaret had not rigged the piano to play on its own, but I was not losing my marbles either. This was something entirely different, something not of this world. All at once, the music stopped, and the world around me with it. No wind, no cars, no animals, and no people. Nothing. It was the middle of the night at this point, but where were the crickets chirping, the frogs croaking, the trees swaying? Where was the life outside my home? A little exploration revealed that I was truly by myself. Every living creature in the vicinity had disappeared. What the hell was going on? Why was this happening? I returned home, hoping for answers, but was instead greeted with an unsettling sight. It was so dark I almost didn't see it. Standing completely still next to the piano was that same silhouette from my window. My body instinctively jolted out of fear, but the figure did not react. It was frozen like the rest of the world. I took this opportune moment to investigate. The entity was wearing a dark cloak, one that covered its entire body. At its face was nothing but pure darkness. I cautiously attempted to pull away the shroud from its head, but it wouldn't budge. I studied the figure for a few more moments before a familiar sound filled the room. The piano song recommenced, and in an instant... The world returned to life. A vortex of dark energy swirled around the shadowy figure as it reached out for me with skeletal hands. I fell back 
but managed to escape unscathed, crawling out the front door in an awkward slur of motion. Rushing over to my car, I got in and took off with no specific location in mind, happy to be anywhere that wasn't my own home. During my drive, I weighed my options. Destroying the piano came to mind, but the risk outweighed the reward. It could just as easily backfire, angering whatever spirit was haunting its keys. Seeking help wasn't really an option either. The only person who might believe me was Margaret. That was it. Margaret. Maybe she would know what to do. My tires left tread marks in the road as they peeled off in the direction of Margaret's house. The whole drive was a blur, my mind in dire straits over the piano and its ghost, but luckily the trip was a short one. It was light, but I didn't care. With the car parked in the driveway, my still shaking legs carried me up the walkway toward the front door. My march, however, was impeded. The cloaked figure was there, standing at the door to Margaret's house. Before I could so much as turn in the opposite direction, it grabbed me by the arm with its bony fingers. Its vicious strength kept me anchored in place. My body cowered as it leaned over me, almost as if to say, Leave this place. Its grip waved for a moment, allowing me a small window of opportunity to escape. I hightailed it out of there without looking back. Defeated, I had no choice but to return home. I hesitantly stepped past the piano and walked up to my bedroom, where I locked the door and fell onto my bed, I'm mentally exhausted. I would not have even a moment of solace, as the song started up again the second my head hit the pillow. The house quaked beneath me, but I remained still, sick of the repetition. The banging on my bedroom door that followed, however, succeeded in startling me. I jumped out of bed and pushed my dresser to the door. Hiding beneath my sheets, I attempted to tune out the ruckus around me. The banging persisted, but I chose to instead focus on the song, allowing myself to properly listen to it for the first time. Surprisingly enough, it was beautiful. Dark and sullen, but beautiful. Its melody soothed me, relaxing me to the point that my eyes grew tired. Despite the pandemonium, I fell asleep and dreamt. The dream world I found myself in was different from that of my usual dreamscapes. It was overwhelmingly vivid and ambient. Words like surreal and otherworldly just don't cut it. The awareness I had is also difficult to explain. Lucidity is too small a concept. I was completely aware of my surroundings in the sense that I could feel everything about them, their history, their purpose, and their place in relation to the rest of the world. I know that doesn't make much sense, but it's the only description I have to offer. The dream's visual makeup was that of a forest. It was dense, but my astral form floated to a clearing past the roots and branches. It was a large meadow, and at its center a large red tree. Every fiber of my being knew where I was. This was the blood tree, the precursor to my piano, the building blocks of a haunting in the form of a sacred plant. As I marveled at the beauty of the blood tree, a person stepped out from behind it, a Native American. He didn't speak. He simply pointed at the tree. This is when the piano leaked into my dream. The song played as glowing lines ran up and down the tree's bark. The Native American put his hand to the wood, motioning for me to do the same. Bewildered and awestruck, I obliged. The glowing lines raced past my skin. It was an incredible sensation. As these lines traveled, my eyes were filled with visions, a glimpse into the blood tree's past. Its bark wasn't always red. Willing Native Americans came up to the tree every year, sliced their hands open, and placed them around its trunk. Their blood then dripped into its base, representing the lifelines of their people. It also signified becoming one with nature, feeding the tree life from within. 
It was the anchor that kept their community together. This is where they gathered and enjoyed life, a place free from worry or judgment, a place of peace. More moments came to me as the glowing lines circled our hands. This was also where the natives buried their dead. After placing one of their own in the earth, one of the elders would play a song on what appeared to be an ocarina, the same song my piano played every night. It was their song of death. When it was all over, a final offering of blood was taken from the fallen and painted onto the blood tree, granting their spirit safe passage to the afterlife. When the vision ceased, my new friend released his hand from the bark, reached into his satchel and pulled out an ocarina. He began playing the song of death, but then stopped. He handed it over and motioned for me to play instead. I wasn't sure what he was up to, but felt no need to defy his wishes. With a little practice, I was able to get the hang of the instrument and play the song he sought to hear. As I played, the blood tree began wilting, its bark changing from red to black. My friend was ecstatic. For one reason or another, this is what he wanted. It wasn't until I woke moments later in bed that the pieces of the puzzle clicked into place. Margaret's ancestors had taken away the native's headstone. More than that, he took away their connection to nature as well as with one another. The tree and its spirits had to be put at rest once and for all, and there was only one way to do this. I can't explain how, but I knew I needed to play the song of death in the piano, the whole way through, without interruption. It was the only thing that would break the curse. I ran downstairs and put my plan into action. When my hands touched the keys... The house violently shook, knocking frames and furniture all over the place. I kept my composure. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw the dark figure standing at my window again. Still, I continued, I had an obligation to persevere, if not for the tree or its ghosts, then for myself. The nightmare had to end. The cloak entity materialized at different spots in the room, Sometimes next to me, other times breathing down my neck. I paid it no attention, despite my fear. I had come too far to let my balance waver now. Just as the shadowy figure sat next to me at the piano, I struck the final note of the song. The madness around me stopped. A weight was lifted from my shoulders and those of many others. I turned to the figure beside me, and noticed the pelt of dark energy surrounding it was no longer there. It reached up and pulled the shroud from its face, revealing its identity. It was the Native American from my dream. He threw me a thankful smile before vanishing, happy to be released from his purgatory. I, too, was elated. The ordeal was over, and countless spirits could rest easy free to cross over to the other side. My work was done. Months have passed, and the piano remains in my living room, quieter than it's ever been before. I even play it from time to time. If there's one thing you can take away from my experience, it's to be mindful of the things that go bump in the night. Some of them might just be wayward souls trying to communicate begging for a chance to be heard by the living. Try your best not to be frightened. You might be surprised by what you can do to help. And please, let this tale be a warning to you. Don't ever buy strange things from Craigslist. You'll thank me later. I hope you enjoyed The Haunted Piano by author Christopher Maxim, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed the tales you've heard tonight, I'd like to remind you one last time that tonight's featured author 
has an amazing selection of stories for sale on Amazon.com. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash maxim. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash maxim, spelled M-A-X-I-M, and you'll be redirected to the author's profile at creepypastastories.com, where you'll find links to his social media, as well as a means of donating to him directly or pursuing his collections of short stories and anthologies on Amazon.com. And again, if you give any of Chris's work a try, please leave him a quality review and a kind word, and be sure to let the author know you heard of him on this program and that Otis Jiry sent you. It would mean a lot to me. Before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining me for this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word as well. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring Twice the Terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs or become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Gyre channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, too. Just search for Otis Gyre. Until next week, stay spooky and get some sleep, if you can. <laughs> Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Jiry. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, The Otis Jiry Channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name, and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program 
each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs>